Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about ultra low RDS on 750 volt switches that enable new frontiers in inverters and in circuit protection power electronics. My name is Anup Bhalla. I represent United Silicon Carbide, which is now a part of Corvo. We'll spend the first part of this talk discussing the generation four silicon carbide FET technology and the kind of products it makes possible. Then we'll talk about some traction inverter examples using United Silicon Carbide's FET jet calculator. Then we're gonna take a look at something different, how we can use generation four normally on JFETs directly in inverters as low side switches. And then I'd like to spend time on solid state breakers using the six milli ohm 750 volt silicon carbide FET. There's quite an amazing variety of advanced technologies available in the 600 to 750 volt class of devices. Silicon superjunction technology is now almost 10 times better than the basic unipolar limit for silicon devices. GAN devices come in lateral form. They are normally on and normally off hence. The normally on ones being gas coded in various ways. Silicon carbide MOSFETs, they come in planar and trench MOSFET types. And then there's the trench JFET which is what is pursued by United Silicon Carbide because it offers the lowest specific on resistance in that voltage class. It's useful to plot the resistance per centimeter square of chip size versus the breakdown voltage rating of the device. That's what the chart on the left shows. Uh, there are solid lines that show the unipolar silicon limit and the light blue line shows the unipolar silicon carbide limit with that dashed line showing, showing what's possible if you also account for the fact that you may need to leave 100 microns of substrate. And here you can see that the generation four silicon carbide technology from United Silicon Carbide is getting the closest to those light blue lines and is well below those of other competing technologies. United Silicon Carbide's transistor technology is all built around vertical JFETs. And the reason for that is captured in this slide. Gate oxides grown on silicon carbide are quite non-ideal channel mobilities are poor on the order of 20 to 40, and that leads to larger chip sizes for MOSFETs. If you compare that, compare that with the bulk conducting JFET, the mobility in the channel is on the order of 600. Now, the JFET shown in this picture is a normally on device, so to turn it into a normally off device, it is cascoded with a silicon MOSFET, a low voltage MOSFET, with whose resistance per unit area may be a tenth that of the JFET. Now the temperature dependence of this resistance is shown on the chart on the right. You can see that there is a 3x improvement over the best in class silicon carbide 650 volt MOSFET, even though that Gen 4 is a 750 volt technology. And this decreases to about 1.8x at 150 degrees C. But across the entire range, you can have an improved resistance per unit area. And this allows more chips per wafer and lower capacitance in a device of given on resistance. So that physics is what leads to United Silicon Carbide having some of the lowest on resistance devices on the market. The generation three, seven milli ohm, 650 volt device from the end of 2019 and the late newly released six milli ohm, 750 volt device that we'll be talking about today. Another thing JFETs are known for is their ability to withstand short circuits very well. And that has been used in the six milli ohm 750 volt device to throttle down the short circuit current without compromising their on resistance. And you can see here that these devices are capable of a five microsecond rating with a TJ start of 175C and a 400 volt pass. United Silicon Carbide devices are useful in the higher power segment. But even in that segment, we have a range from six to 60 milli ohms with lots of choices in between. So the users can optimize the cost, thermal performance and efficiency targets that they may have. These devices serve a wide range of applications from onboard chargers and DC-DC converters, totem pole PFC circuits to inverters. And of course, it's important in fast switching circuits, not just to have good conduction losses, but also deliver low capacitances so that the devices have good performance and low switching losses. And you can see the left chart is a compilation of the comparative resistance per unit area between the Gen 4 technology and competing silicon carbide MOSFETs. Then the RDS EOSS is one way to look at hard switching figures of merits. 
and on the right, the RDS COSS transient is one figure of merit suitable for soft switching circuits. And in soft switching circuits in particular, the fact that you can even drive gas codes zero to 10 volts given their five volt threshold uh, helps to reduce gate drive losses. And the excellent body diode means even if you lose resonance, the device works well. And with that background, let's delve into some traction inverter examples. The two-level voltage source inverter is the most popular topology for traction inverters. The 6, 9, and 11 milliohm devices in the 750 volt Gen 4 series are well suited for traction inverters, and they are intended for discrete-based inverter designs. Uh, these devices feature very low RDS on, low RDS EOSS, a simple 0 to 12 volt gate drive, a low forward drop body diode, and in the case of the 6 milliohm in particular, a 5 microsecond short circuit rating. The calculations that we're about to look at were done using a tool from United Silicon Carbide called the FetChet calculator. Uh, this slide shows its interface. On the left, you see where you can select the devices and enter all the user inputs. The uh, FetChet calculator then gives you the driver recommendations. And on the right hand, it shows you all the results, including the conduction and switching losses, the total dissipation in the device, and the temperature rise at the junction given the thermal inputs uh, provided by the user. So the first example we look at is how 750 volt 6 milliohm SIGFETs stack up against IGBTs in this application. So like this table shows in the example of an inverter working with a 500 volt bus at a frequency of 8 kilohertz up at 200 kilowatts, if you were to actually push an IGBT into this realm, it would have very high switching losses and conduction losses. So the efficiency would be around 98%. Total dissipation at 200 kilowatts would be as much as four kilowatts. And you can see that using six of the 750 volt, six milliohm devices in parallel, you could get down to 1,286 watts of total loss. So this is a, this is a massive improvement. What's more, the same configuration when looked at at light load like 50 kilowatts has about one sixth the loss. So between these characteristics, you can not only simplify thermal design, but also extend the range of the vehicle quite a lot. So we can now ask the question, the SIGFETs work well against IGBTs, but how about against other silicon carbide MOSFETs? So here we compare the 750 volt 11 milliohm silicon carbide Gen 4 FET versus silicon carbide MOSFETs, one at 15 milliohm 650 volt, another at 20 milliohm 650 volt. So we could ask the first question, what happens if you use a given amount of silicon carbide? Well, for that, because of the low RDSA of this technology, the clear winner in producing lower losses will be the silicon carbide FET. And the other question we can ask from a cost perspective is if all of them were designed to operate at a certain peak temperature under peak loading conditions, then what would be the amount of needed silicon carbide? And you can see from the highlighted, um, the, the, the rows highlighted in green, that clearly the silicon carbide FET offers a considerable reduction in the needed amount of silicon carbide. These low RDS on power discretes offer a very cost effective way to make very highly efficient inverters. Here's a design example from AC propulsion of a 200 kilowatt unit. This uses a generation three, nine milliohm, 1200 volt United SIG FET. And you can see it provides a very high efficiency over a broad range of operating conditions. Now I'd like to touch upon the use of normally on JFETs directly in the low side traction inverters. In this schematic, we are showing the use of a normally off high side device and a normally on low side device in a traction inverter. So if the high side devices were silicon carbide FETs, they would have the ratings of 6, 9, and 11 milliohm. If the same JFETs were used with the optimal gate drive as the low side FET, they would then offer a resistance of 4.5 milliohm, 6.6 milliohm, and 8.7 milliohm. So much lower on resistance with the same JFET chip. That raises the question, why do it 
Well, one reason is the low conduction and switching losses offered by directly using JFETs. But another is that the normally on nature of the JFET can be put to good use in this application. Because they are normally on devices, if control power is lost, you can see the low side three JFETs will short the motor windings of the motor. This should help generate zero torque in the motor, lead to no skidding and allow the device to smoothly come to a halt. This provides a low cost, dependable, fail safe mode of operation, simplifying functional safety. The temperature sensing of the JFET gate source junction can be utilized to monitor the help, health of the discrete inverter or the power module based inverter. The normally off FETs on the high side prevent shoot through during startup. This slide addresses one of the unique features of directly driving a JFET. Because the JFET gate is actually a PN junction, it has a well-defined temperature characteristics. So if it was forward biased at a milliamp, you can see that its forward drop would decrease linearly with temperature. And this in fact can be used to sense the temperature of the power semiconductor with a very, very short delay time. So a current fed drive for the JFET, which would turn it on with the pulse of current, then hold it on at a milliamp, turn it off with the pulse of current, is the ideal way to utilize the functionality of the normally on JFET. Because JFETs may be somewhat un unfamiliar to the power electronics community at this point, since most of the world is focused on normally off silicon carbide FETs, let's take a look at their characteristics. So in the on state, we show here the normally on JFET with a minus five volt threshold. At zero volt, it conducts a high current. And with two volts, you can get a somewhat lower, 10% lower conduction loss. The temperature dependent characteristics are shown here. The resistance does increase rapidly with temperature. Uh, the particular JFET here, which is a 5 milliohm 750 volt device, has a resistance of 4.8 milliohm at two volt drive. The chip is actually 3.8 milliohm. And you can see from the middle picture that once a negative voltage of 10 volt is applied, that is sufficient for this device to block its full rated voltage. In, in the third quadrant, even in the absence of a diode, the device has a diode-like characteristic. The forward drop is, can be quite high if the off-state negative drive is high. So by appropriately selecting the negative drive for the off-state, you can monitor, you can manage how high the Q3 voltage drop is. Of course, with these devices, usually synchronous rectification is used. So the device is not operated in Q3 in the third quadrant without synchronous rectification for any length of time. And of course, the JFET, uh, the standalone JFET is much easier to control in its switching characteristics. So this is an example of that three leaded to 47 device being switched with two different types of gate drive, plus two minus 15 and plus two minus 10. You can see fairly easy control of DVDT and DIDT with well-managed waveforms is possible even up to very high current levels. Let's look at another worked example of how the low specific on resistance of these generation 4 750 volt JFETs can be used. So the picture on the top left is shows two 20 milliohm 650 volt MOSFET die in parallel to create a 10 milliohm device. The picture in the middle shows two small JFETs that together in parallel yield a resistance of 3.9 milliohm. You can see the chips are a lot smaller. And using devices roughly the size of uh, the MOSFETs, you're looking at uh, a 1.8 milliohm 750 volt composite switch. So for, by the calculations shown below, uh, it becomes clear that the with the 3.9 milliohm 750 volt device, the same uh, sort of junction temperature can be hit in this application while using half the silicon carbide area and the same number of uh, packages in the application. And the last line in green indicates that using the 1.8 milliohm device, you can end up with the same half RDS on, the same usage of silicon carbide, but now you can drop the number of packages needed in half. So the low RDS on of these devices, coupled with their ability to limit current, means that they'll be a good fit for solid state circuit breakers, and that we will briefly touch on next. Here is an example of using that 5 milliohm 750 volt device in a TO leadless package. 
it can be used to form, in this case, an e-fuse. Many devices may be parallel. If the application requires a bi-directional switch, they may be configured in a common source back-to-back -back configuration. This slide illustrates one of the many techniques that may be used to slow down silicon carbide FETs for use in solid state breaker applications. In this case, a six milliohm device in a two to 20 package has been slowed down with a external CGD with a small resistor in series and then a typical 50 ohm resistor for the MOSFET gate drive. And under, with this condition, the device is shown easily turning off 550 amps the TVS clamp has been set at 400 volts in this case. Thank you for your attention. This concludes my talk and I'm ready to take your questions.